Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. The world's top semiconductor maker planning to make the most advanced chips in the U.S. by 2026. What could it mean for the U.S. economy and competition? China's leader landed in Saudi Arabia today. Chinese-Arab relations will be on the agenda as Xi Jinping is expected to attend a China-Arab conference during his stay. 23 U.S. House seats flipped in the midterms. We take a closer look at some of the more notable changes. Billionaire George Soros was the biggest political donor this past midterm election, but how much has he spent on media influence around the world? We take a look at a new study. A Twitter lawyer fired. It's over his alleged role in suppressing internal documents about preventing the Hunter Biden laptop story from reaching the public. We bring you analysis. In a few years, the most advanced semiconductor chips will be made on U.S. soil. The hope is it'll lessen supply chain issues that have disrupted the U.S. economy. And today's Jessica Beatty has more. Taiwanese chipmaker TSMC is planning to triple its planned investment in Arizona. It'll build a second plant in the state by 2026. That plant will make three nanometer chips, the most advanced chips on the market. President Biden visited TSMC's first Arizona plant Tuesday. He said the three nanometer chips are a game changer for most tech because the chips only consume half the power and they improve performance. These are the most advanced semiconductor chips on the planet. The chips will power iPhones and MacBooks, as Tim Cook can attest. Apple had to buy all the advanced chips from overseas. Now they're going to bring more of their supply chain here home. TSMC's investments in the two Arizona facilities will total some $40 billion. It's one of the largest foreign investments in U.S. history. The plants could give an edge to the American military and economy at a time when tensions with China are heating up. Meanwhile, representatives from the United States and European Union discussed semiconductors Monday outside Washington. It was their third bilateral trade and technology council meeting. U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo said one focus is to align their approaches on semiconductors. We're collaborating around an early warning system for supply chain disruptions. We did speak extensively about export controls generally as it relates to semiconductors, and I think the TTC will play a very important role in aligning export control uh, strategy. The U.S. and EU are already working together on export controls targeting Russia. Raimondo said she thinks they'll work together on export controls for semiconductors, too. Back in October, the Biden administration blocked exports of advanced chips to China. Fears are China's communist regime could use advanced chips to speed up development of artificial intelligence and weapons platforms. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. Chinese leader Xi Jinping arrived in Saudi Arabia today. He will attend meetings that could result in billions of dollars invested in the country. And today's Daniel Monahan has the story. Saudi Arabia aims to increase trade with Beijing and discuss regional security when China's leader visits Riyadh this week. The kingdom seeks to expand superpower ties beyond the increasingly fractious alliance with the United States. Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is expected to mark Xi Jinping's arrival on Wednesday with a lavish welcome. Diplomats in the region say such a welcome may contrast starkly with the muted reception offered to U.S. President Joe Biden in July. The world's biggest oil exporter is reshaping its foreign policy to reflect the new realities of global power. This as it perceives American disengagement from the Middle East and the U.S. administration's direct talk about human rights. Besides rolling out the red carpet for bilateral meetings with Xi during his two-day visit, the Saudi rulers will also convene fellow Gulf leaders for a summit with him. The United States has expressed concerns about growing Chinese involvement in sensitive infrastructure projects in the Gulf. For decades, the U.S. has ensured Saudi Arabia's security and remains its main defense supplier. Crown Prince Mohammed, better known as MBS, has resisted previous U.S. efforts to constrain Saudi action. This includes its war in Yemen, and it appeared to welcome the reportedly transactional approach of former U.S. President Donald Trump. When Trump came to Saudi Arabia in 2017, MBS demonstrated the warmth of their relations with an extravagant welcome ceremony that the diplomats said was expected to resemble what he will offer Xi. Trump left Riyadh with more than $100 billion in defense contracts. 
The Chinese delegation this week is expected to sign agreements worth $30 billion with Saudi Arabia. China sees Saudi Arabia as its key ally in the Middle East due not only to its oil exports, but also a shared suspicion of Western interference, especially on issues such as human rights. Meanwhile, a federal judge in Washington dismissed a lawsuit against Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman on December 6th for the 2018 alleged murder of Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi. The judge cited President Joe Biden's granting of immunity. Joe Biden, as a presidential candidate, had said his plan was to make the Saudis pay the price for the alleged murder and make them, in fact, the pariah that they are. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Billionaire George Soros was the biggest political donor this past midterm election, spending $129 million on Democratic candidates. But how much has he spent on media organizations around the globe? A new study looks at just that. A watchdog organization called the Media Research Center recently released part one of their three-part research on George Soros' influence on global media. The study finds that Soros has used his charities, including the Open Society Foundations, to finance at least 253 media organizations around the world. The founder of the Media Research Center, Brent Bozell, spoke about the findings on Fox News on Monday. Everywhere you look, you know, when you look at the Pointer Institute, the big fact checker, mm -hmm. it's funded by George Soros. How many people know that when you go on Google and you look up something, immediately you get Wikipedia, funded by George Soros? The media organizations include Project Syndicate, a publisher of commentaries that has received over $1.5 million, the Pointer Institute's International Fact-Checking Network, which has received almost $500,000, and National Public Radio, which has received $600,000. Bozell says he believes Soros is a dangerous man. Here's his comment on Soros' ultimate goal. George Soros was asked that question, and his answer, you know, what, what do you want? His answer to me is, chilling. It chills me to the bone. His answer was, I want to change the arc of history. That's how ambitious this man is. The Media Research Center says it will release parts two and three of its research later. They will detail exactly how much money Soros has spent on media organizations and which corporate media received Soros's money. Twitter CEO Elon Musk has fired the company's Deputy General Counsel James Baker. Baker is also a former FBI General Counsel. We bring you some analysis on this, including a potential conflict of interest. Joining us now is Mike Davis, the founder and president of the Article 3 Project. Mike is also the former Chief Counsel for Nominations to Senate Judiciary Chairman Chuck Grassley. It's great to speak with you today, Mike. Thank you for having me. Twitter CEO Elon Musk accused James Baker of suppression of information important to the public dialogue, and journalist Matt Taibbi claimed Baker vetted Twitter files before Friday's release. What does the public need to know about the significance of this? Yeah, so James Baker is a, a character that keeps popping up in these various scandals. He was a top appointee in the Obama Justice Department, and then James Comey hired him to go work at the FBI, he was the general counsel of the FBI for Comey, and he was behind the Russian collusion hoax. He was fired from the FBI, and then he went to the uh, he went to serve as the deputy general counsel, a top lawyer at Twitter, and it was James Baker uh, again at Twitter who was uh, behind uh, working with the FBI and and suppressing the New York Post's reporting of the Hunter Biden laptop scandal, which almost certainly threw the election for President Biden uh, in 2020. Baker has not said anything publicly about his apparent departure from Twitter. You said Baker may have a serious legal ethics problem here and asked if he was working against his client by covering up his own misconduct. Can you explain this? Yeah, so if Elon Musk is asking his lawyers to go through the files, the Twitter files, and publicly release them, which is in Twitter's best interest as a company to get this out there and get past this as a company. And James Baker is, uh, is reviewing his own files that are damaging to him. That is a, an obvious conflict of interest. He is working against his clients instead of for his client if he's doing that. And if that's the case, he, he faces serious ethics charges as an attorney for Twitter. 
And Taibbi claimed Baker delayed the release of a second tranche of internal files, and journalist Barry Weiss will soon publish a second batch of files, according to Taibbi. What can we expect to happen here? Well, I think they're going to get to the bottom of this now that they've got this James Baker character out of Twitter. Elon fired him, which is the right thing to do. Uh, I think what you're going to see, and I, I just from look, looking at all the smoke, it seems like Jim Baker is working with the FBI to suppress the Hunter Biden laptop. And maybe Jim Baker, a, a former FBI official, it, it is part of the 51 former Intel officials who came out and said that the Russian, uh, that the New York Post story was uh, was part of a Russian, uh, a, a Russian hoax. So I hope they get to the bottom of this. This shows that the FBI and big tech is rotten to the core. They are partisan. They, they are advocating for Democrat candidates. And when the other side screams about democracy, that means that they're the ones who are going against democracy. When you have the FBI colluding with big tech to censor, silence, deplatform, cancel conservatives and others with whom they disagree, we have a major First Amendment problem. This is this is the biggest scandal we've seen in a long time as a country that makes the Democrats' Russian collusion hoax pale in comparison. Well, we're definitely going to be keeping a close eye on how this all develops. Mike Davis, the founder and president of the Article 3 Project, great to have your analysis. Thank you. The results from Georgia are out. Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock is projected to win re-election. He defeated challenger Herschel Walker by a narrow margin. Walker conceded last night. Warnock came in with close to 51 percent of the vote. Walker had just over 49 percent. That's with 98 percent of the estimated vote counted. The win gives Democrats an outright majority in the Senate for the rest of President Biden's term. Warnock had this to say at his victory speech. for women, to stand up for our children. I'm ready to build a stronger Georgia. God bless you. Keep the faith and keep looking up. Walker did not argue with the results. He thanked God and his supporters and says running for the U.S. Senate has been the best thing he's done in his life. There's no excuses in life. And I'm not going to make any excuses now because we put up one heck of a fight. I want you to believe in America and continue to believe in the Constitution and believe in our elected officials most of all. Continue to pray for them because all the prayers you've given me, I felt those prayers. This race was the most expensive one of the 2022 midterm season. In total, more than $400 million was spent. The runoff was held because neither candidate secured 50% of the vote in November's general election. Today, the U.S. Supreme Court is taking on a case regarding election laws. It's centered around a dispute over North Carolina redistricting, but the implications could be far-reaching. The crux of the case is a theory called the Independent State Legislature Doctrine. North Carolina Republican lawmakers are asking the justices to adopt the legal theory. They say it allows state legislatures to set rules in federal elections without any constraints by state courts or other state authorities. The theory is based on the U.S. Constitution, saying state legislators determine the time, places, and manner of congressional elections. But opponents say the theory goes against checks and balances within state power. For example, the North Carolina Supreme Court found that the GOP legislators' redistricting map violated the state constitution. They ordered a new map, which resulted in a 7-7 split in last month's midterm. This year's midterms were the first elections after after redistricting following the 2020 census. 23 congressional seats flipped. Here's a closer look at those. A total of 23 seats in the U.S. House of Representatives flipped political parties during the 2022 midterms. Of the 23, 16 went from Democrat to Republican, while 7 flipped from Republican to Democrat. Let's first take a look at some of the seats that switched from Democrat to Republican. Florida's 13th district has been newly redrawn. It was previously held by Democrat Charlie Crist, who resigned to launch an unsuccessful run for governor. Republican Anna Paulina Luna defeated Democrat Eric Lynn to take over the seat. In California's 13th district, Republican John Duarte declared victory against Democrat Adam Gray. District 13 has not elected a Republican since the 1970s. 
In Iowa's 3rd District, Republican State Senator Zach Nunn narrowly defeated two-term incumbent Democrat Representative Cindy Axney. Axney was the state's only Democratic member of Congress. And over in New York, a total of four districts flipped from Democrat to Republican. In the Empire State's 3rd District, New York Republican George Santos defeated Democrat Robert Zimmerman. In the 4th District, Republican Anthony D'Esposito defeated Democrat Laura Gillen. In District 17, Republican Mike Lawler defeated Democrat Sean Patrick Maloney. And in the 19th District, Republican Mark Molinaro defeated Democrat Josh Riley. And here are some notable seats that switched from Republican to Democrat. Alaska's only congressional district seat was left vacant by the death of Republican Representative Don Young in March. Young had held the office since 1973. Democrat Representative Mary Peltola is now in charge. In New Mexico's 2nd District, Democrat Gabriel Vazquez defeated freshman incumbent Republican Yvette Harrell by a margin of about 1,300 votes. The win once again gives New Mexico an all-Democrat congressional delegation. In Texas's 34th District, Republican Myra Flores defeated Democrat Dan Sanchez in June's special election. However, Flores was defeated on November 8th by two-term Democrat Representative Vicente Gonzalez. Starting in January, when the new members are sworn in, Republicans will control 221 House seats, leaving Democrats with 212. Coming up today marks the 81st anniversary of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Over 2,000 service members were killed during the raid. We'll hear from a survivor. Food delivery robots. The machines operate on 30 U.S. college campuses, as well as some in Europe. More in just a moment, here on NTD News Today. Virginia's governor issued an executive order for state agencies to report all fines, fees, and suspensions related to COVID-19 shutdown violations. Governor Glenn Youngkin's executive order says state action imposed during the COVID-19 public health emergency put businesses at risk and barred people from carrying out important daily activities. Youngkin also announced for his upcoming budget he will order a stop to enforcement of all COVID-19 shutdown policies as well as the collection of fines and fees. He also plans to develop a reimbursement process. The new measures will not apply when the alleged violation is related to rules that protect the health and safety of people in nursing homes, hospices, or assisted living facilities. The lockdown policies were put in place by the state's previous governor. Youngkin calls them COVID-era draconian overreach. An Oregon state judge granted a temporary halt on all provisions of the state's gun control measures. The new laws were scheduled to take effect on December 8th. Under Oregon law, residents currently do not need a permit to purchase firearms, and though a background check is required, it does not need to be completed before buying a gun. There are also currently no restrictions on magazines. The new law would require residents to complete a background check to obtain a permit to purchase a gun and would prohibit the manufacture, sale, use, and purchase of magazines that hold more than 10 rounds of ammunition. The judge says the measure violates the Oregon Constitution. The law has been temporarily halted pending a December 13th hearing. According to Oregon Live, Oregon's Attorney General intends to petition the Oregon Supreme Court for a review of the decision. And today marks the 81st anniversary of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. A survivor recounts the day that will live in infamy. And today's Andrew Thomas reports. That's her father there. Uh, USS Arizona sailor Lou Contour lived through the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. He miraculously survived after his battleship was hit by two bombs and sank. Out of those 2,403 men who got killed, 1,177 were on the Arizona shipmates of mine. But the 101-year-old doesn't consider himself a hero. We're not heroes. They call us heroes, but we're not. It, the ones that 2,403 men that died are the heroes, and we've got to honor them ahead of everybody else. For many years, Contour flew back to Hawaii for an annual remembrance ceremony. But due to his health, he'll watch a video feed of this year's 81st anniversary observance from home. I'd like to be there because uh, there's only two of us still living from the Arizona and Ken Pot myself. Contour went to flight school after Pearl Harbor. He flew 200 combat missions in the Pacific. 
One night in 1943, he and his crew were shot down near New Guinea. Ultimately, he survived despite dozens of nearby sharks. Contour's son reflects on the Pearl Harbor anniversary. It's going to be a sad day, but uh, he's an American hero. You know, now he's an American he's my hero. You know, so um, it's pretty cool. In the late 1950s, Contour became the Navy's first SEER officer, an acronym for survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. Some of his pupils used his instruction to survive as POWs in Vietnam. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Philadelphia police have finally identified a child found dead inside a box 65 years ago with the help of DNA analysis. Known as the boy in the box case, the child was discovered in February 1957 in northeast Philadelphia. He was estimated to be between four and six years old and weighed only 30 pounds, appearing to be malnourished. Several scars were also reportedly found on the boy's body. Police say the case is Philadelphia's oldest unsolved homicide. Officials plan to hold a press conference Thursday to discuss any new developments in the case. An unexpected discovery in the drought-stricken Mississippi River has paleontologists excited. It's a fragment of a fossilized jawbone with a tooth that experts believe is from a lion species that went extinct thousands of years ago. An Oxford, Mississippi resident came across the artifact when he saw something black sticking out of a sandbar in late October. He thought it could be from the long-gone large American lion, and that was confirmed by experts at a nearby fossil symposium and exhibition. The Panthera atrox, otherwise known as the large American lion, went extinct roughly 11,000 years ago. Experts say this lion was a longer version of the, Ameri- of the African lion by about 25%, about 4 feet tall and 5 to 8 feet long. They weighed at least 500 pounds, with some topping 1,000 pounds. The American lion lived on the continent for more than 300,000 years during the Ice Age before extinction. It's believed only three other known fossils from these lions had been found in Mississippi. An Estonian-based company has rolled out a fleet of food delivery robots on U.S. college campuses. Entity's Andrew Thomas has more on the machines that could help meet the perpetual demand of hungry students. Students head to classes at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Among them, fully automated robots roll around carrying food. Anybody can download the app, uh, just like a DoorDash or, or Grubhub, and they can place a pin on campus and order from whatever restaurant is available. That restaurant will then fulfill the order, load the robot, and the robot will be off to you fully autonomously. Comery says Starship Technologies has these robots on roughly 30 U.S. college campuses. Other locations include the U.K., Germany, Denmark, Finland, and Estonia. Around the world, we have almost 2,000 robots now. Um, You know, we've just completed our four millionth delivery worldwide uh, just a few weeks back. Not only are the robots convenient, they reduce the number of cars on campus. Um, You know, every Every 10 deliveries that a robot does takes out a a car. Throughout the course of a day, the average robot will deliver 10 deliveries, and that's, you know, taking carbon emissions out of our campuses, making them cleaner and greener. But Starship's robots do have their skeptics on UIC's campus. I don't think they're the most reliable, and I'm sure you're being taxed on extra for using it as a service. So most kids are probably going to avoid that and just go to Starbucks or something easier. Other students say they're fans of the food delivery bots. Sometimes I'm lazy, so I don't want to go and get my own food. If someone could bring it to me, that'd be nice. (laughs) And it like, like sometimes you don't have to deal with people like the Uber Eats driver. It's nice, just a robot. These robots could be the future of coffee on demand or late night pizza delivery. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Apple has been sued by two women. They say its AirTag devices have made it easier for their former partners and other stalkers to track down victims. The women say Apple has been unable to protect people from unwanted trafficking through AirTag. This since launching what it called the stalker-proof device in April 2021. 
Starting at $29, air tags are just over an inch in diameter. They're intended to be slipped into or attached to keys, wallets, backpacks, and other items so people can find them when they are lost. But privacy experts and law enforcement have said some people use air tags for criminal purposes. The plaintiffs called air tag the weapon of choice of stalkers and abusers. They also say it's been linked to murders this year of women from Akron, Ohio and Indianapolis. And in another major litigation, Jewel Labs has settled more than 5,000 cases from close to 10,000 plaintiffs. The e-cigarette maker says the terms of the deal can't be disclosed, but it involves an equity investment to financially support the resolution. The cases included consumer class action suits, government equity and government entity, personal injury, and Native American tribe groups. An investigation showed Juul purposely marketed its items to young people, even though they're illegal for children to use. According to a national survey taken in 2021, more than 2 million teenagers in the U.S. say they vape, some on a daily basis. The grocery chain Little has issued a voluntary recall of one of its candy advent calendars due to a possible salmonella contamination. The 8.4-ounce packages of Favorina-branded advent calendars say premium chocolate with a creamy filling on the front. The affected items were available at Little locations between October 12th and December 5th and have a use-by year of 2023. Customers can return the product to the store for a full refund. The company found the issue during routine testing and says it hasn't gotten any reports of illness linked to the calendars. Symptoms of salmonella infection include diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. Infection can sometimes be fatal in young children and the elderly. Guns, knives, nunchucks, you name it. Airport screeners have confiscated lots of items people try to carry onto planes. Well, this week, someone placed a dog in a backpack and tried to get it through security at a regional airport in Madison, Wisconsin. The backpack with the dog inside went through the x-ray machine. Now TSA is reminding passengers that all pets need to be in carrying cases, and pet owners must remove their animals and only send the empty carrier through their screening machine. The discovery in Wisconsin comes weeks after someone packed a cat inside a suitcase at JFK Airport in New York. And still to come, Maryland Governor Larry Hogan announced a ban on TikTok from government devices, making him the third U.S. governor to block the social media app. We'll have the details when we return. And a video goes viral of a former CCP official's daughter publicly opposing lockdown measures, threatening to kill in self-defense. We'll have all that and more for you right here on NTD News. Most people know from Christopher Columbus is that in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. There's so much more to the story of Columbus that today very few people know the actual story of Columbus. For example, Columbus had more than one voyage to America, which is shocking for most people to discover, but the reality is he had four voyages. And today, in modern culture, there's a lot of people very critical of Christopher Columbus. In fact, over the last couple years, when there was a movement to tear down statues, Christopher Columbus had over 600 statues erected to him around the world, and the vast majority of those statues were torn down, were vandalized, but they're really tearing down these monuments of Columbus without even knowing what Columbus even did. Right, and so, so let's go through this, because some of the accusations we hear today is, right, Columbus enslaved them the Native Americans. You can hear a lot of negative things today, so let's just back up. Welcome back. Another U.S. state puts TikTok on the blacklist. Joining South Dakota and South Carolina, Maryland has become the latest state to ban the Chinese social media app from government devices. Maryland Governor Larry Hogan announced the directive yesterday. He cited the software's potential for spying on government entities and gathering users' information. U.S. officials have repeatedly warned that TikTok could steal data from U.S. citizens and pose a threat to national security. The ban also covers other companies such as Huawei and China's state-owned tech firm ZTE. The directive also bans the use of WeChat and Alipay, which is under online retail giant Alibaba. That means government agencies must remove these products from state networks and prevent them from being installed or accessed on devices. 
Republican lawmakers are warning of a threat to national security posed by a Chinese state-controlled shipping platform. They say the digital logistics system could provide the Chinese Communist Party with sensitive U.S. government and military data. Beijing is offering the platform to freight carriers, ports, and foreign nations free of charge. They call it a one-stop shop for data management and tracking shipments. It's subsidized by China's Ministry of Transport. Over 20 global ports are using the platform already. Senator Tom Cotton and Representative Michelle Steele called it a disaster for American interests in a letter to President Biden. They worry the CCP could exploit it to identify early trends in the movement of U.S. military supplies and equipment, while at the same time denying other countries the same data on Chinese military assets. Over 25 congressional GOP members joined the letter. They urged Biden to take action to stop the spread of the system. And also in China, we've been covering how the Chinese regime forcibly takes people from their homes to quarantine camps, even if they tested negative for COVID. And now a video of former Communist Party officials' daughter opposing these acts went viral among Chinese netizens yesterday. The video shows Liu Xiaoqin, the oldest daughter of a CCP general, picking up kitchen knives from the table. She warned officials that if they enforce the law violently and do things that are inhuman and devoid of conscience, they will be greeted with a kitchen knife. Liu is the daughter of a general who once served as China's Minister of Public Security and Vice Premier of the State Council. This video is currently blocked on Weibo. If they want to kill my cat, if they want to drag me to the camps, I firmly tell you, the Constitution grants me the right that if you want to use violence, I have the right to self-defense. I am 75 years old, and I'm not afraid of death. You're law-breaking ducks. You can come to me. If I die, I will take you with me. Anyone who violates the law, breaks into homes, and violently enforces the law, you will be greeted with kitchen knives. I will chop you one by one. Some background for context. Back when a residential community was locked down, authorities would go into homes and spray everything with disinfectant, even throw away food in the refrigerator, and pets like cats and dogs were beaten to death. That's why the lady was trying to defend herself and her pets. And now the white paper movement from college students is also pushing back. The Chinese regime has announced a series of measures to ease its zero COVID policy, but it's unclear how well the new policies will be followed. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And just ahead, Germany's largest post-war fraud case goes to trial. Three top managers of payment company Wirecard stand accused after owing creditors billions of dollars. We'll return with more after the break. Germany has arrested 25 people on suspicion of plotting to overthrow the government and seize power in a violent coup. Prosecutors said the group was inspired by the deep state conspiracy theories of QAnon and the Reichsburger. Members of the Reichsburger don't recognize the legitimacy of modern-day Germany and insist the larger Deutsche Reich still exists despite the Nazis' defeat in World War II. Here are the details. A suspect who calls himself Prince Heinrich from the former royal house of Reuss was seen as the designated leader of a future state. Germany's monarchy was abolished a century ago. Prosecutors say he contacted Russian officials with plans of establishing a new order, but that there was no evidence of a positive response. The military intelligence said other members included several reservists and an active soldier in the Special Forces Command. A former member of parliament for the AFD party, who currently serves as a judge, is also being investigated. The plotters are suspected of developing concrete plans to storm the Bundestag with a small armed group since the end of November 2021, at the latest. Prosecutors further say the group focused on recruiting members of the military and police officers. They are suspected of preparing for the armed attack through the hoarding of military hardware and holding drills. The arrests were made early on Wednesday morning in raids across the country. More than 3,000 police and security forces from 11 German states took part, with suspects also arrested in Austria and Italy. 
the House of Rus has in the past distanced itself from Heinrich, calling him a confused man who pursued conspiracy theories, according to local media. Wirecard's top executives will go on trial tomorrow. The former payments giant is at the center of the biggest fraud scandal in Germany post-World War II. The company's CEO, Marcus Braun, and two other top managers face a number of charges. Those include fraud and market manipulation. The three allegedly cooked up large amounts of false revenue to hoodwink investors and creditors. Founded in 1999, Wirecard rose to prominence from handling payments for illegal activities, including pornography and online gambling. The company filed for bankruptcy two years ago, owing creditors some $4 billion. Both former Chancellor Angela Merkel and her successor, then-Finance Minister Olaf Scholz, were blamed for ineffective oversight. A verdict in the Munich court is not expected until 2024 at the earliest. If convicted, Braun and others may face up to 15 years in prison. Braun denies wrongdoing and accuses others of running an operation without his knowledge. Now turning to news from Russia, at the United Nations, calls grow for a ceasefire and diplomacy in Ukraine. But the U.S. and Russia both accuse each other of not being interested in the peace talks. What you're seeing now is an ongoing war of the West against Russia until the last Ukrainian. This is something that leaves us no other option but to continue the aims of our special military operation. President Putin's escalating barrages on Ukraine's infrastructure are evidence that he has no genuine interest in negotiation or meaningful diplomacy. Instead, he is trying to break Ukraine's will to fight by bombing and freezing its civilians into submission. Moscow initially said its mission was to disarm Ukraine so that it could not be a threat to Russia and denazify it by rooting out leaders it characterized as nationalists. Western countries say that means Russia's true aims were to defeat Ukraine's military and to overthrow its pro-Western government. The Russian ambassador accused Western countries of not being interested in diplomacy as they deliver more and more weapons to Kyiv. The UN Security Council has met dozens of times about Ukraine since February, but they can't do anything meaningful since Russia is a veto power, along with Britain, China, France and the U.S. Russia is requesting the Council meet again on Friday to discuss weapons from the Ukraine conflict falling into hands elsewhere in Europe, the Middle East and Africa. Over to Spain, two commuter trains collided this morning in the northeastern Catalonia region. Over 150 passengers were lightly injured. The emergency services said 155 people required medical attention and three of them were sent to hospitals with light injuries. There have been several accidents in recent years in Catalonia's suburban train system known as Rodalias. Catalan officials blame lack of funding from Spain's central government for the network's deficient upkeep. performance that truly matters for each and every one of us. This is what you've been waiting for. See it at least once in your lifetime. Get tickets now at ShenYun.com. The lasting beauty of realistic oil painting. Brilliant, expressive, and inspirational. The 6th NTD International Figure Painting Competition. Guided by pure authenticity, beauty, and goodness. Invites you to join us on a journey back to traditional art. The gold award is $10,000. For more details, please visit oilpainting.ntdtv.com. Good to have you back with us. Thousands of military history fans are recreating Napoleon's famous 1805 battle, the Battle of Austerlitz. The event commemorates the battle that made France into the dominant power in Europe. NTD's Flinders Kingsley has the story. Military aficionados from 15 different countries gathered in Austerlitz in the Czech Republic. With thousands of participants, the drama is so big it could be a set for a movie. 
Initially, it was a challenge for me to be able to organize this and make it happen. Now we are the biggest event of this kind in Europe that lasts this long. There is nothing like it. The armies arrive and set their camps up just as soldiers would have done over 200 years ago. People from all over the globe come to participate in the Battle of the Three Emperors. We participate because we enjoy performing this act for people and we fight for the Austrian artillery. The reenactment tries to follow the story faithfully. Napoleon's men were outnumbered. The French with 72,000 and the Russian-Austrian alliance had around 85,000 soldiers. During the battle, the Austrians and Russians launched their main attack. 10,000 French fended off 40,000 Russian-Austrian soldiers and then repulsed a second assault before Napoleon launched a counterattack. It is interesting that people from across the world, now it is 15 countries, US, Canada, Europe, can arrange this, agree on the script of this act, gather here, sleep somewhere on the ground and create this friendly reunion for this historical event. Napoleon launched 20,000 men into the Russian-Austrian occupied zone, the Pratzen Plateau, a zone Napoleon previously evacuated to try to trap the Allies, a trick that won him the battle. This is not a glorification of Napoleon at all. It is remembering an event that has shaped Europe for many years. The Russian-Austrian allies lost 15,000 and had 11,000 captured. Napoleon lost 9,000 men. For reenactors, it is not about being on the winning side. Our unit represents Russian artillery, specifically the artillery company of Major Stjaden. We have a cannon replica and I always attend because this is an excellent group of people. Four days after the battle, Austria signed a truce and later in the month signed a peace treaty that would see France as the dominating power of Europe. Flinders Kingsley, NTD News. A buried treasure is discovered in central England. Archaeologists unearthed a 1,300-year-old gold necklace that features garnets and semi-precious stones. The necklace and other items were found at an excavation site chosen for a future housing development. Researchers from the Museum of London Archaeology say they believe the necklace was buried with a powerful woman, maybe a princess or abbess. They actually found the treasure in April, but didn't announce it until now. Officials say it could take a few years before all the research on the items is complete, but they could eventually be placed on public display. Visitors to Winchester in the UK can now experience a multimedia exhibition to understand a key moment in England's history. That's King Alfred's defeat of an army of Viking invaders. The 878 AD exhibition has teamed up with the creators of a popular video game to open the doors of history to a new generation. A group of Anglo-Saxon warriors prepare for battle in support of their King Alfred. The cast of the historical actors are part of the 878 AD exhibition in Winchester, the capital of the Wessex Kingdom and one of the most important cities in the burgeoning English nation. Wessex was the last kingdom in 878 AD. This was Alfred's last stand, if you like. The the Vikings had taken over the rest of the country and uh, and after the, the Battle of Eddington, of course, when they were defeated by Alfred, um, England really started, if you like. The 878 AD exhibition is a multimedia experience, bringing together live action theatre with interactive displays and augmented reality technology. The Hampshire Cultural Trust is the lead partner in the project. Uh, We've felt for some time that a more immersive experience that can appeal to a wider audience than perhaps the traditional museum and heritage audience is really critical for uh, the success in a city like Winchester. 878 AD has teamed up with the creators of the video game Assassin's Creed to help bring early medieval Winchester to life. The exhibition uses visuals and artwork from the popular video game to recreate a historical, accurate version of the Anglo-Saxon city. It, it is clearly one of the main aspects and the perhaps which makes uh, something which makes uh, Assassin's Creed quite unique is to have that authenticity, even uh, uh, a level of historicity in the game. 
Assassin's Creed is fun, is adventure, but it is also a way to rediscover history differently. Visitors can experience the augmented reality by using an app on their phones and walk the streets of modern Winchester to discover the ancient city. With 878 AD Winchester Revealed, we've created an immersive AR experience, one that geolocates memories around Winchester, which you can then step into, that you can see content from the game, but crucially that lets you explore the city as it was then. In designing the app, designers incorporated many of the elements from the Assassin's Creed, Valhalla game. The violence from the video game has been removed, making it suitable for all ages, with puzzles and problem solving, replacing the axes and swords. One of the great advantages of being able to use content directly from Assassin's Creed Valhalla is that fans of the game are able to see that content in a different way. They're able to engage with the history of Winchester in a different way. At the exhibition, visitors can also try a game of Tefl, a sort of early Nordic forerunner to the game of chess. A blind eel, deep sea batfish, spiderfish and more all recently discovered on a sea floor in Australia. The previously unknown creatures were found below the surface of the Indian Ocean near the Cocos Islands Marine Park. A team of scientists with the Museum's Victoria Research Institute recently mapped the region in detail for the first time. The map spans nearly 7,000 miles. The project revealed flat-topped sea mountains with volcanic cones, sharp ridges and canyons, and also brought unknown sea life to light. Those include the blind eel with loose, transparent skin, the pelican and slender snipe eels, high-fin lizard fish, and others. The museum's chief scientist of the expedition says this represents a discovery of, quote, an amazing number of potentially new species living in the marine park. And coming up, the inventor of the Rubik's Cube reflects on its worldwide success. The toy began as a classroom teaching tool in the Cold War era Hungary. Details to come on NTD News Today. Today marks a major moment in human history. Half a century ago, Apollo 17 lifted off to complete the last manned mission to the moon. On December 7, 1972, NASA launched the Apollo 17 rocket from Kennedy Space Center with three astronauts on board. Two of them, Eugene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt, spent three days on the lunar surface, marking the longest stay of the Apollo program. The third member, Ron Evans, orbited the moon. They brought back 250 pounds of lunar samples. NASA's Orion capsule is orbiting the moon this week. It will land near the coast of San Diego on Sunday. NASA calls it a dress rehearsal for the next lunar flyby in 2024. A manned moon landing could happen as soon as 2025. Spider-like robots could soon be inspecting Japan's sewer pipes in the not-too-distant future. They're able to go where previous robots could not. A Japanese robotics startup announced the new robots last month. They're made to inspect Japan's aging sewage system as the industry grapples with a labor shortage. The CEO says many sewer pipes in Japan are nearing the end of their 50-year lifespan, but a severe shortage of manpower has made inspection and maintenance difficult, and the wheeled robots currently in use can't cross certain surfaces and areas. The new robot has a 360-degree camera system and eight legs. The legs help it maneuver in tricky situations with a skilled controller. It's currently still a prototype and can only inspect the pipes, but the company hopes it could one day carry out simple repairs as well. If you've ever had trouble solving a Rubik's Cube, here's some advice from the man who invented it. Break it down into steps. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more from Rubik himself. Erno Rubik has seen his color matching puzzle go from a classroom teaching tool in Cold War era Hungary to a worldwide phenomenon. Over 450 million cubes have been sold. We were behind the Iron Curtain and it was, takes about three years to cross the, con uh, uh, the border. And after that, in, in, in the two, three years, it became a, a real a worldwide craze. The original 3x3 Rubik's has 43 quintillion possible configurations. Seasoned cube solvers can complete it in a matter of seconds. Problem solving its a very basic activity of human mind and, and, uh, and uh, if a problem is 
complex. You need to divide the problem for smaller elements, smaller pieces. The current world record holder was able to solve a Rubik's Cube in 3.47 seconds. The World Cube Association also has records for fastest solver while wearing a blindfold and fastest one-handed solver. It took 36 years after the toy was invented to determine the minimum number of moves to solve it. In 2010, a group of mathematicians and computer programmers proved that any 3x3 Rubik's Cube can be solved in 20 moves. Probably the, one of the main key of the cube is the contradiction between uh, complexity and simplicity. The brainy nature of the Rubik's Cube may be part of the reason it has endured, while other toys and games have not. In 2014, it landed in the National Toy Hall of Fame, joining such childhood classics as Barbie, Hot Wheels, G.I. Joe, and the Hula Hoop. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. It's done. The weather outside might be freezing, but that does not mean your fruit and vegetable options aren't sizzling. There are many winter produce options out there right now. Here's Gina Marie who brings us Strong Mind and Body. If you take a closer look at the produce aisle right now, you'll find some standout cold loving options. This will surely increase your appetite for winter and also the nutritional value of your diet. In-season fruits and vegetables likely have a higher concentration of vitamins and minerals. From soups to stews to salads to stir-fries, there seems to be no limit to their culinary uses. Seasonal root vegetables can be very budget-friendly and benefit from a long storage life. Here are the best options when it comes to winter fruits and vegetables. Let's start with beets. Notable for their sweetness, beets have some of the highest natural sugar levels of any veggie. They contain an antioxidant that may help to combat certain cancers. They also contain nitrate that can improve blood flow. This aids in lowering blood pressure numbers. Blood orange. Their flavor tends to be sweeter and less tart than typical oranges. On top of a wallop of vitamin C, the color of these blood oranges signals the increased presence of potent antioxidants. These can help to lower the risk for cognitive decline. Next up is butternut squash. This curvy winter style wart is jam-packed with beta carotene. This can improve brain functioning as we age. Beta carotene also helps to boost your immune system and is good for the eyes and skin. Next is Brussels sprouts. This veggie is loaded with vitamin K, a nutrient which can lower the risk for certain types of heart disease. And let's not forget fennel. Fennel is crisp and crunchy with a pleasant and mild licorice flavor. All parts including the white bulb, green stalks and wispy dill-like foliage are edible. Fennel contains a flavonoid antioxidant that may lower the risk for some cancers. Our next veggie is parsnip. Parsnips are nutty and slightly sweet. Just one cup packs in 7 grams of fiber, 3 more grams in carrots. A recent study showed that people with higher intakes of fiber are at a lower risk of premature death from various diseases. This includes type 2 diabetes. Let's look at pear. Nutritionally, pear's claim to fame is stellar levels of dietary fiber, 6 grams in a medium fruit. Most people need to be eating more fiber to promote better gastrointestinal health. And let's not forget turnip. The flesh is crispy with a peppery zing and delivers plenty of vitamin C. Research suggests adequate intakes of vitamin C can help lower the risk of suffering a stroke. So there you have it, an impressive lineup of winter fruit and veg. They are sure to keep you healthy until strawberry and asparagus season arrive. A drink popular in the 1980s and 90s is experiencing a resurgence here in 2022. It's the espresso martini, a mix of vodka, coffee liqueur, and espresso. The drink has gotten so popular that according to research firm CGA, it's entered the top 10 list of most ordered cocktails at U.S. bars. It even knocked the classic Manhattan off that list. The espresso martini is thought to have been invented in the 1980s. According to inventor and famed bartender Dick Bradsell, it all happened when a model asked for a drink that would wake her up but also get her very drunk. 
At least one beverage brand can possibly chalk recent gains up to the surge in the espresso martini's popularity. Kahlua recently said that it hit a new record, growing by double digits globally. That's all for today's program. We're really glad to have you with us. Please send us an email if you'd like to tell us something. We're going to put it on screen. For podcasters, that's news.today at ntd.com. I'm Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.